G'day everyone, welcome to Lubrication Explained. In this video we're going to talk about GF6 as well as its relation to the new SP API standard. We'll talk about why GF6 is necessary, we'll talk about what's new compared to the SN Plus designation, and we'll also talk about the differences between GF6A and GF6B. Alright, so if you remember um, we, in a previous video, I think on CK4 and FA4 oils, we talked about the development of engine oil standards. And at least in the diesel engine oil space, we kind of talked about engine oil specs and how they map onto uh, emissions regulations around the world. And the fact that we really kind of moved in the early 2000s from an emissions control age through to a fuel efficiency age. So emissions control was related to particulate matter that came out of the exhaust, as well as the things like uh, sulfur dioxide. Um, but in reality, you know, the, the gains that had been made there were orders of magnitude, and there were very little uh, particulate matter coming out the exhaust of most cars. So the next way that you could pursue kind of gains was in terms of fuel efficiency. And if we were to look at the fuel efficiency of different vehicles all across the world, what you'll see is that there's been a, a clear uptick since about uh, 2010. So that coincides with some um, higher oil prices, but also um, a, a focus on, on climate change. Specifically, if you take a look at cars and SUVs, um, you've seen quite a big increase in uh, miles per gallon uh, from kind of the early 2000s onwards. So how have they kind of achieved that in terms of engine design? Well, functionally, uh, one of the first things that they did was to reduce engine sizes. Um, so, you know, where, you know, four litre V8s had been common in the past, now, even if you look at Ford EcoBoost engines and things like that, one and a half to two litres is, is pretty much the norm for most passenger cars these days. Also, turbocharging. So turbocharging obviously allows in a, in a smaller uh, volume engine, right? So if you're going down to two liters, if you still want to put a significant amount of power through it, you need to increase the amount of uh, air that's delivered into the, uh, uh, into the engine. Plus, you need to uh, inject more fuel. So the rise of direct injection engines. Um, that has also enabled fuel efficiency gains. Plus, um, you know, engines that do stop-start. I know that that's super annoying for a lot of people <laughs> um, who drive cars that uh, turn the engines off at lights. But in reality, that's been done for fuel efficiency reasons. You've also got um, the rise of uh, battery hybrids, right? So obviously, we're moving to a, a full EV age um, with the advent of you know the Teslas and and the works that VW is doing. But in the interim period. Uh, hybrids and plug-in hybrids have become a lot more common. Um, and lubricants also play a huge role um, in fuel efficiency as well. And you've started to see really, um, you know, low viscosities um, to the point where, you know, 0W20 has become a thing. And in as we'll show later in this presentation, um, 0W16 is actually the, the new standard. Unfortunately, that brings about LSPI. Now, I did a video on this um, previously called uh, it's Low sp uh, Speed Pre-Ignition, where effectively you get early firing. So in a, uh, a typical engine, what you'll see when it's operating correctly is obviously four strokes, right? Um, and there is a, a bit of a, a sine wave when it comes to pressure. Um, reality is there is a peak pressure on the exhaust stroke, um, but the the ignition of the fuel happens a little bit after the piston re reaches top dead center on the, com the compression stroke. But in a uh, engine that is experiencing low speed pre-ignition, you tend to see uh, firing occur before top dead center, which causes a pressure wave that acts in the opposite motion of the piston at that time, and that can really damage the top landing. Now, low speed pre-ignition has become a massive problem in the industry because it occurs in direct injection um, turbocharged engines uh, which have become so much more predominant because they are more efficient so in a, in a drive to to make vehicles more efficient we have downsized the engines and we're putting much more fuel and 
air through a, a smaller space, that is effectively causing LSPI. We know that detergent chemistry has a part to play in that. Um, specifically, calcium detergents seem to make it worse. So there are some changes that needed to happen in the industry. So calcium detergents, if you remember, um, they kind of look like this. They form micellar um, structures. Um, if they're overbased, they'll, they'll be called a TBN molecule. And these are starting to be sort of replaced in a lot of new engine oil formulations with magnesium-based detergents. All right, so let's look at the evolution of the S category. Um, so it has, you know, if you go back to the 1990s, uh, we had the SH uh, version of uh, passenger vehicle oils, and then it went to SJ, SL, SM, SN. Then we had an interim SN+, plus, which was followed by SP, which is the new regulation that came out in 2020. Now, um, at each of these intervals, there were new tests and new requirements that were introduced. So with SH, there was one additional test. SJ, there was an additional one test. SL, there were an additional four tests. SM, back to one. SN, one. SN+, plus, an additional one. The thing that's unusual about the new SP, or ILSAC GF6 uh, formulated oils, is that we're adding an additional seven tests, which is why it is, uh, has been delayed a couple of times and why it's been so difficult for a lot of the lubricant manufacturers to meet this spec. If we actually look at what the tests are, all right, so uh, GF5, or also, as it's also known, API SN, had tests for valve train wear, low temperature sludge, oxidation, bearing corrosion, fuel economy, um, and then there were no tests for low speed pre-ignition or chain wear. Now, why was the SN plus um, designation given? It was kind of an interim measure. So a lot of the OEMs had discovered that low, low speed pre-ignition uh, was becoming a prevalent problem in the industry. And they asked the lubricant manufacturers to address it in an interim measure. So what you'll notice here is that the only new test was to address low speed pre-ignition. And that was kind of a holdover knowing that it would take too long until the SP designation came along um, and they sort of couldn't afford to wait. Then SP came along and what you can see is that there are a number of new tests around valve train wear, low temperature sludge, oxidation, fuel economy, we keep the new test from low speed pre-ignition from SN plus and we also have a new test for timing chain wear. So what do we expect out of these new tests, right? These new standards. Well, um, effectively what we can expect is better fuel economy, better LSPI protection, uh, better chain wear um, uh, from a, a timing chain protection standpoint, improved cleanliness and better high temperature viscosity control. Now you might say, okay, what in the formulation is gonna drive us to those benefits? That's a good question. So better fuel economy effectively means that you'll start to see lower viscosities. So as we'll show soon, GF6 includes a new 0W16 spec. Um, but what you're gonna see over time is that uh, viscosities are just gonna get lower and lower as a lot of the engine OEMs try to meet emissions targets. For LSPI protection, um, we know that calcium detergents contribute to low speed pre-ignition. So you'll see a lot less of those and probably a lot more magnesium based uh, detergents. From chain protection, um, you'll see probably more ashless anti-wear additives. So we can't put more ZDDP into uh, new engine oils because they of course um, poison catalytic converters. So what that means is that if you want to protect a uh, chain from an abrasive wear standpoint, you need to include more ashless anti-wear additives. Most of the uh, industrial ashless anti-wear additives are actually based on sulfur or phosphorus. So we can't use those because of uh, concerns about the catalysts. So most likely you're gonna see uh, probably boron based um, anti-wear additives. Improved cleanliness. Well, we improve cleanliness through better solvency of the base oil package, as well as improved detergents. Okay, um, the other thing that probably is gonna be included is more dispersants and specifically higher weight dispersants. Um, so, difference between detergents and dispersants, just to clear that up, so detergents um, are trying to uh, take contaminants and hold them in solution, dispersants are really trying to uh, 
you know, in a way, hold hands is probably the better way of, of saying it, and, and carry a contaminant to the filter where it can be extracted. Um, better high temperature viscosity control. So what you'll probably see here is higher quality base stocks. So um, more of the GF6 oils are going to be um, probably you know, semi-synthetic or pure synthetic. Um, you'll probably also see start to see the co-bases start to change. You'll see more alkylated naphthalene and some higher quality esters where before they might have been, you know, uh, diesters. We might start to see um, some, uh, you know, things like polyol esters. And ultimately, uh, more synthetics is going to give us uh, better high temperature viscosity control as well. So these are all the things that you can probably expect to see from a new generation uh, engine oil versus an, an older generation. So GF6 is actually split um, into GF6A and GF6B. So what are the differences between these two? So with GF6A, um, that's really a kind of a, in a sense, a backward compatible spec. So in the past, we always had 0W20, 5W20, all the way up to 10W30. So if you were to take a GF6 uh, 10W30, you could kind of, you know, replace your old 10W30 oil with the GF6. However, GF6B addresses 0W16, which is an entirely new viscosity spec, right, that never existed before. And so what you'll see on the package is you'll see a little bit slightly different labeling. So the old ABR, API, what they call Starburst, which is the one that's in orange, um, that will apply to all the old viscosity grades. But the shield, which I've got in blue here, will be exclusive to the 0W16 grade. Um, both of these, uh, so the shield is new, um, both of these will indicate um, that the lubricant has passed all the tests that certify it for ILSAC at GF6. Now how does that relate to SP? Well, if you combine the two of these, um, you get the API SP service category. So um, aside from either the Starburst or the Shield, you should also see the what we call the API Donut on the package. That'll specify, first of all, uh, the API service category, which is SP, the SAE uh, viscosity, which you know, as an example, might be 0W16. And you should see also down the bottom um, something like resource con uh, conserving, because it should have, um, in order to get SP, it should have passed the um, uh, fuel efficiency criteria um, as dictated by the API. So yeah, I hope that's been a uh, helpful introduction to the ILSAC GF6 and API SP categories. I might do another video um, going to a little bit more detail on all those tests um, because I think uh, some of the technology that goes into it is quite interesting. Um, but anyway, otherwise, uh, this has been Lubrication Explained. As usual, if you've got questions or comments, please leave them down below.